El Perfecto. All right, so we are in the uh, book of Daniel, right? And we um, we went, we're in chapter 7 now, and we got through, uh, I don't, we got through a good little bit. We ended up kind of like uh, about halfway through, I think. We were right there before verse 12, maybe, when we stopped. But uh, just a little recap, that this was uh, Daniel's dream. If you'll remember, originally, whenever everything started in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream, and he... I don't mean to be repetitive, but if you haven't studied this stuff a lot, I do mean to be repetitive because this is a lot of information, right? And so there's, we shouldn't be scared of repetition. Um, so in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he had a dream about an image. Y'all remember that? Head of gold, chest and arms of silver, loins and thighs of brass, lower legs of iron, feet and toes of iron and clay. And it described different empires um, that is the interpretation that Daniel gave him and that ultimately the kingdom there was a kingdom to come that was made of a stone not with man's hands and that it came and it crushed that image and so what we learned about that dream was was that that at some point in time too I just want you to know is that the feet that re that are made of iron and clay actually with the ten toes are descriptive of the coming kingdom that is going to be a mixture, most Bible scholars agree with this, that in some way, shape, or form, that there's going to be a connection to the old Roman Empire to the kingdom of Antichrist, if that makes sense. Listen, there's a lot of things that are going on in the world today that have a uniting, whether it be the connection of the United Nations, the, the Treaty of Rome started many, many years ago. I tried to do research. It's kind of hard. Sometimes you can't get all the answers because you think somebody may be just putting some information out there. You don't want to just regurgitate things that you don't try to cross-reference. So I tried to do all that, but as best I can see that maybe the Treaty of Rome originated with 10 nations. Many people do believe that the area where this uh, Antichrist situation will take place will be somewhere in the old Roman Empire, right? And the old Roman Empire spread was spread all the way from the west and then all the way into the east. It covered Jerusalem. It covered all that area there. <clears throat> but the idea is, is that there's going to be a re- confederation of nations 10 i just want you to be reminded of that the number 10 i don't know what that's going to look like when it happens will it be again another uh, something happened to do with the un i looked that up the other day they got the they got the the the, the g7 uh, council right so i mean all you need is three more in that one I'm, I'm just trying to make a point that i do believe that there's going to be some interconnection there's going to be a conglomeration of nations that are going to come up and then out of that 10 according to the way that the bible's uh, showing us various things in the different chapters of daniel but then also in the book of revelation the word the number 10 is repeatedly used 10 toes in daniel 2 10 horns in daniel 7 10 horns in Revelation chapter 12, 10 horns in Revelation chapter 17, and it, it's connected to kings and kingdoms. And that ultimately, when you get to Revelation uh, 17, you realize that it's from there that the Antichrist gains his power as he he comes out of those 10 all right so i'm just trying to like uh communicate with you in a way that we're just kind of conversing so that you're aware of that if you ever decide to study the book of revelation it wouldn't be the first time you heard that now we were we were studying in chapter seven that had to do with nebuchadnezzar's i'm sorry daniel's dream and he's dreaming a sim something similar to to what to what that image was and in um in daniel chapter seven Verses four through seven, just to remind you, well, I'm just going to list it. I don't want to go back and read that, but we're going to, because we're going to move forward and read a lot of verses tonight and kind of cross-reference again in the book of Revelation. But in Daniel chapter seven, verses four through seven, Daniel's vision or dream was number one, there was a lion with eagle's wings. And again, you got to understand that when Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, these are having to, you just got to take a word for it and you go back and you study. And I, and I had to study it several times before I even understood or could wrap my, my mind around it. Because a lot of times it is, it's a lot of new information. But, but the reason that we know is because Daniel already told us in chapter 2 that the image represented four different nations that were going to rise up during during his time and then after his time rome came after him okay uh, just to, just to give you a little bit of a heads up to remind you the story of daniel 
You, you remember, he, I, I, I always describe it like Daniel was a teenager. Most scholars believe he was about 16 years old whenever Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian army, besieged Jerusalem. What does that mean? It means to encircle them and, to, and, as, and militarily to take them over. And then one of the times I explained how they would have, the wall would have been a possible, uh, like something like if we were to walk to San Antonio. And it brought them to Babylon. But then while once Daniel was an older man, then the Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians took over Babylon. And, and Daniel had, uh, had actually prophesied that that was going to happen. So it literally happened during his time frame. And then not long after that, then Alexander the Great. Now, we believe that Daniel would have been dead by that time. But not long after that, the Grecian Empire, which was part of, which was the, the, loin, the, the loins and the, and the thighs of the image that was made out of brass, which was, which was Alexander the Great, because that was the next one. It was Babylon they had, Medo-Persian Empire here, and then Greece here, and then Rome down here, the lower legs. And then again, that final kingdom that's coming. Now, look, when we get to Daniel chapter 9, we're going to see for the first time where we get this seven, seven year period. Y'all listen to me because this is important stuff. We're gonna, there's one place in the Bible that talks about a seven year period. Did you know that? Did you think that the Bible had a seven year period a whole bunch of times? When I'm talking about a seven year period, I'm, what, what do you call the seven year period? Because I've been having a lot of conversations with a lot of people and not, we don't all, not, not everybody agrees on what you call that. Wasn't that Jacob, like Jacob's trouble? Well, that is the time frame of Jacob's trouble. That's correct. It's a, it, it, now, but many people call it the seven-year tribulation, right? Yeah. Uh, that, and so that's what I'm kind of talking about. But, but let's just say the last seven. Can we say it like that? The book of Revelation doesn't even mention a seven-year period. You know that, right? I've scoured the book of Revelation many a times. Verse by verse, word by word, multiple times. It talks about three and a half years multiple times. 3.5 years, 42 months, 1,260 days, according to the Jewish lunar calendar. Oh, a time, times, and half a time. Uh, over and over, but never does it say seven years. That's right. It says the last three, it's talking about three, 3.5, three and a half years, which is half of seven. But Daniel chapter 9 specifically talks about a last seven-year period. So when we get to the seals of the book of Revelation, that's going to be important. Because we're going to talk about when does this seven-year period start? How do we, what does it look like, right? And then in the middle of that is when everything goes haywire. And, and tonight, when in Daniel chapter 7, we're going, to, we're going to get into information again about the Antichrist. Because Daniel prophesied about it. Daniel, whenever Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, it was approximately 586 B.C. All right. And so Jesus doesn't come until AD 33. So when we're talking, to, I mean, he, he, you know, AD 3 or 4 is what scholars say when he was born, but he, he was crucified somewhere around AD 30, 30, 33 and a half years is what we say. His ministry was three and a half years, which is kind of interesting, too. Right? I mean, if you think about it, Jesus's ministry was three and a half years. The last, the last of the, of the Antichrist is three and a half years. It's almost like, you know, it, we'll, we'll get into that later. But, Nevertheless, I'm just I'm just trying to make a make a point that the about that we're going to get into the Antichrist tonight uh, because Daniel prophesies about, it. and we see little clues and symbology that alerts us to what it looks like. All right, one of the things that we're going to come across tonight too is the word saints. I just want to go ahead and get this out there so that we can just talk about. And in, in this Old Testament passage in this chapter it talks about the it uses the word saints many times. And then, and then in the, and then in the, uh, in the book of Revelation, it also talks about the saints, but it talks about them in a way that's a little bit different. It doesn't look like it's going too well for the saints. So what I'm trying to say for y'all that are here tonight, at some point in time, we got to try to determine in our own heart, in our own mind, what, who we think the saints are. Now I'm going to let you know before we get moving that there's two different schools of thought. The saint, many people ascribe to the saints here and also in the book of Revelation as the Jews because it doesn't fit within the framework where it could be Christians if they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture like they call it. 
Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? And, and whenever we get into it deeper. In other words, these saints that are being persecuted at the time frame, they, can, they if you believe in a strong pre-tribulation stance and you, and you feel like, and I'm not, listen, I'm just saying, y'all, y'all, each one of y'all in this room got to come to your own conclusion whenever we're done with this. Y'all got, and we wake up tomorrow, we love each other and we hug each other, right? And, and I'm going to tell you what, what I think and what I see here, but I'm not over here. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to stimulate thought. All right. So what I'm trying to say is, is that if you believe, if you believe in a strong pre-tribulational stance, you can't believe that the saints are the, or the church or the people of God because they should have been gone by now. When you get into the book of Revelation and it starts talking about the saints, right? And so, and we'll get into that whenever we get there. But what I want, but one of the things that bothers me about that, and I'm doing a little bit of preliminary talk about this, and we're going to just start reading through the scriptures here in a moment. But one of the things that I, that I guess I question as a person that studies the Bible as much as I do, and I didn't just accidentally hiccup and come across that. It's always bothered me. Every single time that I've listened to the Bible on tape and it gets to that part, it's always bothered me. Because why? The word saints is never used to describe Jews, just to describe Jews in the New Testament. Never, ever, ever. It describe, now, if, if they were Jews, they were saved Jews. Because saints are the holy separated ones. And what's interesting is, is that in Daniel chapter 7, which was originally written in the Aramaic, the word means the same thing. It means to be holy and separated. You could make the argument that the, that the Old Testament Israelites, <laughs> that the Old Testament Israelites were considered separated and holy because they were the children of God. I'm okay with that. And you could even make the argument that the saints in the book of Revelation were Jewish people that when the rapture happened, that they got saved and that now they're saints. I, I'm with you. So, so that, that is an argument that people could make. And, and I look at it from every angle, every time I come across a passage of scripture. So I understand where people can make that. But there's other things that we got to connect all these little things together, like a puzzle to come to the, fine conclude, the final conclusion of, of where we're going with that. But I just want to go ahead and give you that heads up ahead of time that the word saints is used. And it's describing that the Antichrist is persecuting them. So, so, you know, if, if you, if you believe that that's the Jews, then, then, you know, that's okay. Just, you know, keep that, if that's the position, you know, and that's the position of a lot of people. So then that doesn't really affect you. But if that word saints actually means believers, people that are Christians, and, and, and then we get into further scriptures that show some other things about timing then it's kind of like, you know, I feel like we just need to be a little bit more sober and just kind of like approach it from a fresh, from a fresh standpoint, if that makes sense. You know, you kind of like, you're supposed to approach the scriptures like a blank slate. Now you never go in there, you know, you and I all know in this room that Jesus is the Christ, amen, and that he died on the cross to set us free and that his blood shed saves us and sanctifies us and we'll never, we know that, we'll never, because many of us have experienced victory in our life from that. Now, I can tell you that I have done a lot of studying even on that. Because guess what? I ran into some people that were Jehovah's Witnesses that did not believe the way I did. And I took it to the point where I went and got one of their translations of the Bible. I went back to the original Greek and started to see some various things because I wanted to be able to have... I knew that they weren't right. And I knew that the Lord, what was happening in my life was right. But I'm going to dig and dig and dig until I can find the answer to where I can communicate it. Yes, sir. Yes, that's a good point. And so there will be, I do believe that there will be people, but many people do say that, <clears throat> that things are going to be a little bit different after the rapture, meaning that it, and you, there's no way to absolutely prove this, okay? But that, that the Holy Spirit's presence on earth is going to be different. And we know it's going to be different. And let me tell you how, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I personally believe what it, when it talks about the restrainer, that, that I believe that it's, it's, some people have said it's the church, that when, the, when, he, when he be taken out the way, talking, saying that that's the church. If it is the church, then it has to be the Holy Spirit's connection to the church. Because see, the, it's talking about the restrainer preventing the revealing of the Antichrist. 
The church by itself is not doing that. It has to be the power of the Holy Spirit. And so whenever it says that the Holy Spirit, I believe it's saying that the Holy Spirit is taken out the way to allow or the restrainer stops restraining and allows him to be revealed. Then that tells us that there's going to be. Now, that's my interpretation that, that the restrainer when we get there, Second Thessalonians 2, we will cover that in detail because it talks about the Antichrist. That is my position. Some people say it's the Archangel Michael. Some people say it's the church. I say it's the Holy Spirit. All right? And whenever, well, yes? Do you mean uh, the going to be completely No, I don't believe that. I believe that the Holy Spirit will still be here. But what I'm trying to say to answer his question and to answer your question is that the Holy Spirit, I believe, will move on the hearts of people more like it was in the Old Testament. I can't really prove that. That's just what I believe. Like, in other words... The Holy Spirit will still deal with human hearts. The Holy Spirit will still will still draw men. They'll still be able to know God is real. He will try. He will move them to to, to you know towards God. But to say that they're going to be filled filled with the Holy Spirit, all, like on salvation, I, I don't I don't know that I that I believe that. I think it's going to be different. But I can't prove it. I'm just I'm just trying to say that that's my opinion. The conclusion that I've come. Yes. Does anybody else have any questions? No, I don't. All yeah. right. So, so the people that are going to be saved in the tribulation, they're going to be. Behaving. Yeah. Well, and I mean that's that's a big part of it, and we'll get to that. And I do believe that that's part. He said they'll be beheaded, and so I do believe that that's a big part of what we're gonna of what we're what we're building up to when we get into the book of Daniel. Not so much beheading right here if, where we are right now. That's more later when we get into the book of Revelation. But um, but. <laughs> What we're starting to see is the persecution of it. whatever our definition of saints is. You might have your definition. It's the, it's people that love God. We know that, and uh, and they will be persecuted. And certainly, the, certainly the enemy will be persecuting Israel during that time frame. He's always persecuting, Israel, and we know that. Um, but uh, but when we get when we get there's a couple of passages of scripture we're going to get to, and Second Thessalonians chapter two is a big one for me. That kind of, that's one of the ones that really, really, really makes me open my eyes and stop and really start to question the timing of certain things, okay? And when we get there, we're going to try to take our time really slow and, dis and discuss it. We'll open everything up for discussion, okay? We'll just read it as best that we can, okay? And it all hinges on that word apostasia or a falling away, okay? Yes, sir? Amen. Uh, is the uh, um, Armageddon? Well, the, arm, the Battle of Armageddon does take place during that, but it, it appears that that's at the very end. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not trying to be over... I've, been, I've actually been being, like, kind of watching the way I'm saying things, mostly because, uh, well, Aaron and I have been having a lot of conversations. And so I've gotten to the point now where, and I like, I like saying it, the last seven is what I call it. The last seven. And, that's, and we're going to learn about that when we get to Daniel chapter 9. Okay, and the reason why I've been trying to call it the last seven is something that was pointed out in Matthew 24, where Jesus says, after the tribulation of those days, and when we get to Matthew 24, and you can do it ahead of time, I'm going to let you know ahead of time. Matter of fact, I challenge each and every person in this room that likes to study the Bible, I challenge you, this is your challenge, whenever it is convenient for you. You remember how we used to have old overhead projectors? Back in the day, and you could lay, you could lay a, a slide on the projector, and it have like a basic outline, and then you could start building slides on top of it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And then the next thing you know, it all fits congruently, and you and you and it's like, wow, look, that was really cool. He did some. Okay, so my challenge to you is to pull your Bible out, and I would just, I would just encourage you. I really would. I would encourage you just to read the scripture. Okay. So, so just get your Bible out and read the seven, read the seals, okay? The seals start somewhere, what, Revelation chapter 5 or maybe, maybe 5 or 6? Five five like, huh? Yeah, it's either 5 or 6. But the first seal, does anybody remember what the first seal is? This is really, but it's not completely off the beaten path because we're talking about the Antichrist tonight. Huh? Yeah. So the first seal is the white rider on the white horse. And we know that that's not Jesus because Jesus comes back on a white horse in Revelation 19. So Jesus comes back at the end for the Battle of Armageddon, but this one's released in the very beginning. Okay. 
And for, personally, for me, many people, I'm just kind of talking now. I don't, hopefully we get to the text. Many people have always said that they believe that the rapture is the initiating event that begins the last seven year period. But I'm here to tell you that I don't see, I don't see that. What I see is it's the signing of the it's the signing of the agreement that begins the last seven because it says it in Daniel 9. Because I'm trying to tell you, the only place in the Bible that talks about a seven-year period is Daniel chapter 9. And that be, that begins whenever they sign that, uh, that seven-year agreement, and in the middle of it, he breaks it. And then from, from then on in, in the book of Revelation, you hear three and a half, three and a half, three point five, forty-two months, twelve hundred and sixty days. Okay, you hear what I'm saying? And so, um, what I was, I never did get to your challenge. So the challenge is, you're going to read the seals. All right? And if you'll remember the seals, what's the first one? The first one is Antichrist. Okay, it's the opening of the seals. Not too many people are arguing about that. Everybody, anybody that knows anything knows that that's not Jesus. All right? So the first seal, the rider on the white horse is is the Antichrist. And then the next thing you know, you got, what, what comes next? The black horse? War. Yeah. Uh, the war, sorry, the red horse. War. Yeah. Okay. Then the, then, the, then the next horse is the black horse, famine. famine. Then the next horse, it says pale, but the Greek word is chloros, which is the, the color of death. This green, chlorophyll, where we get the word chlorophyll. <clears throat> then the next seal is actually martyrs under the altar. Then the next seal is actually when all of a sudden it looks like it's the wrath of God. So the point that I'm trying to make to you is this. Whenever, just because, let me ask you a question. Does it have to be an act of God to cause a worldwide war? In other words, can men cause worldwide war? I'm just, this is just, yeah. this is just something for us to think about. Does it have to be, uh, does it have to be God made for there to be a famine in the land? What is your opinion about this pestilence that we're facing? Trying to call people to repentance? Yeah. Could God cause a famine? Absolutely. Has God caused famine? Absolutely. That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, can man yes. cause famine? Can one great global leader cause a famine? Yes, sir. Yeah. I think uh, if you always said, and the Bible says that there's a spirit that's an angel over these nations. And they don't even know they're being controlled by these angels. Spiritual yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The point I really I think the main point I'm trying to make is is that if the white horse is the releasing of the Antichrist and that he was given a crown to go and conquer is what it says. That means God is allowing it because God has prepared such a time as this to bring to pass what his word had already said. And the main point that I'm trying to make is that certainly a powerful global type leader could make some strategic moves to create famine is what I'm trying to get at. How easy would it be to cause famine? Dude, you just release. I'm just saying, however this COVID pandemic was released, the food shelves were empty within five days. There was no toilet paper to be found. And that was just like a little simple something something. Right? That's the point I'm trying to make. Can man and the manipulation of men that are in powerful places make strategic moves to cause famine? Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Very easy. Because we don't even grow food anymore. That's the only point I'm trying to make. Yes. There is that the shelves are empty right now because the storm is hitting you all and, and all the supplies for these convenience stores. Yes. Are it's empty right it's now. all empty. I just found that out today. Yeah. yeah. I want so, so if the Bible said in the last day there'll be more tornadoes. Yes. More tornadoes. Yeah. It could be all of that. All everything. Yeah. Everything coming together. Attacking the food supply. Everything coming together. So so and then war. We know that men start wars. This is all the only thing. And he's gonna try to be cause global war. You know, and then death, and it talks about death with pestilence. So what I'm trying to say is this is that when you read the seven seals, that's your first layer of homework. You're gonna you're gonna lay that down on your projector screen. And then you're going to go read Matthew 24, and you're going to see Jesus. And he's going to talk about the first thing he's going to talk about is false Christs, yeah. and then he's going to talk about he's going to talk about war and rumors of war, and then he's going to talk about, because he's talking about the end days, and then he's going to talk about famine, and then he's going to talk about pestilences, and then he's going to talk about persecution, and 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 and, and believers dying. Now he's so that's another place where people will say, yeah, but he's talking about the Jews, okay. 
But and then and then after all, and then he's going to talk about an earthquake. And he's going to talk, and, and that's that's coincides with with what it says in Revelation chapter six. I'm sorry, in the seal number six. And then after all of that, he says, then there will be two in the field. One will be taken, and the other will be left. That's right. I'm trying to make a point. I'm not trying. I'm just, I'm just trying to tell you something. I had never read it that way before, and it's very compelling when you read it that way. You do it yourself is what I'm trying to ask you to do. I'm not trying. I'm talking. I'm telling you that read the Bible and compare the seals to Matthew 24. That's it. That's the challenge. Okay, and then we're going to come back to it later on when we get there. All right. Right now we're in Daniel 7. The four empires. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. You raise your hand. No, come on. She gave up. He gave up on you. No. Aaron. <laughs> Sir. Are we in the beginning of sorrows right now? I mean, I know that there, there's a whole lot of people sorrowful. <laughs> but but are we in the tribulation? Not yet. I mean, I, I don't believe we are. Look, let me, let me just tell you this. Doesn't first the man of all, sin have to be revealed first? What's that? Doesn't the man of sin? Yeah, yeah, that no, that, the no that's, that's another tribulation. thing. Like, how, what, at what level? Because we're talking about a seven year period. It's good to talk about these things, okay? We're talking about a seven-year period. Listen, can I even be honest? Like, I don't know. There are people like dog me on Facebook or something like that after they see the video. <laughs> but I, I told y'all, I was, can I just be real? Whenever we talk about human leaders, you ain't supposed to put all your marbles in one bag. Whenever, listen, while people were talking about Ted Cruz running for president, I was, I was already pumping Trump. But I said behind the pulpit, if you'll remember, I don't trust any leader. And what I said was, you need to be careful. And I'm not trying to act like Trump is that. But I do know this. He did sign a, an agreement whenever that peace treaty happened. And you might not have paid attention to it. If everybody else was just like, 2024, baby. My concern is, is that if the whole church is so focused on a man that we think is going to deliver us, that's a problem, my friend. Now, do I love everything that almost comes out of that man's mouth? Can I watch him talk for hours on end? Absolutely. Personally, for me, I'll tell anybody on fan. I think he's hilarious. I laugh so hard, and I just love the fact that that man just says it like it is. And you know what I liked about him the most in the beginning was that he wasn't scared of China. Because I've been saying China's nothing but a bully on the playground. If you don't pop him in the nose now, he's going to keep taking your lunch money. So I loved everything that that man was saying about all of that stuff. Put tariffs on him. I loved it all. But all I'm trying to say is, is that did you not pay attention to what Christians were saying whenever they, it, it, I think they stole the election. But were you not paying attention to what Christians were saying? He's coming back in three months. He's coming back in six months. And I don't know how long he's been. He might be here in 2024. All I'm trying to say is he signed an agreement. And if nobody else was paying attention to that, I was. Does that mean that that was it? No, that's not what I'm trying to say. But I'm trying to say it's going to be something like that. Or he's going to reconvene an agreement that was already in existence. And that's going to be a very difficult one for us to notice and to pay attention to because that's the beginning of it. Yeah. Now, I'm not trying. He, paid, he signed that thing three years ago. So I don't, I don't think we're in the tribulation. That's not what I'm saying. But the nationality of Antichrist, right? Oh, I'm not even trying to say he was the Antichrist. That's not even really what I'm exactly trying to say. I mean, who, who knows? Who knows what, you know, is there somebody connected to him that's that? I mean, was there somebody working behind the scenes and all of that? And, you know, that's what I'm trying to get at. Because there are people close to him that would be the right match. Right. Yes, sir. Another thing you were talking earlier really about the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, I know you and I have talked about this one just so that they can hear it. There's been the idea of first seal, that's when the Antichrist is revealed. And so the restrainer could possibly be Jesus and his not opening the seal yet. Because the Antichrist cannot come until the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, opens the first seal. And that's what's in the first seal. That's, yeah, I, and, and I, I hear the what you're saying. The, but, but, huh? The Godhead, maybe. Uh, yeah. But the, but the only problem that we're the only the only problem that we're that we're running into is that there's so many scriptures that are converging at the midpoint. That's what I'm trying to say. So many scriptures that are that that converge at the midpoint in the middle of the 3.5 that 
that keep yeah. adding up, adding up, right. adding up, and that, and that, that's that, because, for instance, if you look at Second Thessalonians chapter two, it, it seems that the context is really saying not that it would have been him maybe signing an agreement because that that's that's something. But did he break? Daniel nine says he breaks it in the middle of the agreement. He confirms. He confirms. He confirms the covenant in the beginning, but he breaks it in the middle. Right. Okay. And that middle point, so then 2 Thessalonians 2 says that he puts himself he, to be worshipped. Well, Israel ain't going to sign. And Daniel says that Israel signs the agreement. So the point is, is that Daniel's, Israel's not going to sign an agreement with somebody that puts himself in a wing of the temple. And even Jesus talked about that too, the abomination that causes desolation. And says, hey, worship me. Israel is not good. That's blasphemy. They're not going to do that on the front end is the point I'm making. So when it says that he puts it in 2 Thessalonians, is talking about that the man of sin is revealed. That's actually happening at the midpoint when he's really, really revealed. People like you and I might be able to see it because we should be paying attention whenever people are signing peace treaties with Israel. We should at least be on alert for a second, right? I don't care who it is. I'm not, and again, listen, I'm not saying that that's what that was. And I don't think that we're in the tribulation. I don't. But I'm saying anytime anybody signs a peace agreement with Israel, you and I should be awake. We should be sober-minded, and we should be aware of that. And now this even gets crazy, because I definitely don't think Joe Biden's an antichrist. But I will tell you this. Joe Biden, oh, Joe Biden reconfirmed the Abrahamic Accord, which was the agreement that the Trump administration signed with them. So what does all that mean? I don't know. I'm just telling you what I heard, what I read. And all I'm trying to tell you is, is that these are the kinds of things that we should be aware of. Because a peace treaty signed with somebody in times like this with Israel should wake us up. That's all I'm trying to tell you. I'm just trying to encourage you as the body of Christ to have spiritual eyes that can see, spiritual ears that can hear, right? So did it have something to do with the Bible? I don't know. Yeah? Yes. Yes, the Antichrist. Well, the, the thought behind that is this, and let's just let's just be real. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not an expert on where it comes from because it does talk about that, that area, the Mediterranean area. It does one time call him the Syrian. Okay, it does call him the Syrian, and the Syrian is not necessarily a Jew, but a, a Jewish person could be from Syria. But the main the main argument that he's Jewish that I can see now. You, you, hear, you hear me. I'm, I'm not pretending like I know everything. My understanding is that the main argument that he is Jewish is that the Jewish people wouldn't sign an agreement with somebody that wasn't a Jew. So, but we just saw them sign an agreement with the Trump administration. So is it because Jared was a Jew? Is that the only reason they signed it? You see what I'm saying? And so I don't know that that's the... But, if you can, but it, please, if anybody can find another scripture that... Sh yes, sir. Another reason I think that it's likely that he will be a Jew is because he's being anti-Christ. Yeah, if and that makes sense. Jesus, and I, I believe that. He's going to be a Jew, I, yeah, correct? but but again, so that makes sense. No, it does. It absolutely yeah. makes sense because typologically, a lot of whatever he's going to do is to be to try to mimic what Jesus did. Even right. in Revelation 13, he's going to have a mortal head wound, and the, and we believe that he's going to have a faux resurrection. Everything that yes. Sir. Well, I've heard that the Muslims Messiah. Is yeah, that's yeah, but not just the Muslims. There's tons of false religions that are waiting for their Christ to return. The word Christ simply means the anointed one. The whole world is waiting for him to return. The difference is, is that we're, we know it's Jesus and the rest of the world believes that it's the Mahdi. That's the name of the Jewish, the Muslim one. They, the Jews still believe that their Christ is still to come back. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the Buddhists. The, uh, the New Agers, they still believe that there's an avatar that's coming back. All these people, if you read the stuff, people are expecting anybody that's in the know. Everybody else is just like, oh, let's party. You know? So anyway, uh, I know that we kind of got off the beaten trail, but I'm just I'm just trying to be a thinker, trying to encourage people to think. Let's read. Yeah, that's right. And we want that, right? Amen. That's, I do anyway. All right, so again, let's try to cover these empires and we'll see what we can get. I'm not going to keep you all here too long. I thought that was good. I like having discussions. Yeah.
Yeah. Amen. So there were the four empires. You had the lion with the eagle's wings. That was Babylon, which cor correlates with the golden head that Nebuchadnezzar had. The bear raised on one side with three ribs in its mouth. This is Daniel's dream again in Daniel 7. That represents the Medes and the Persians, which was the uh, chest and the arms of silver. And then the leopard with four wings and four heads. <clears throat> it talked about that uh, four heads, four horns. Okay. Um, Greece, whenever, when Alexander the Great, this is history. I don't know if I've told y'all this before, but again, it's a lot of information. When Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was split in four. Four generals. Daniel, Daniel prophesied. So that's how we know that this is coinciding with things that actually happened in history. And therefore, if it happened and Daniel prophesied it then, we believe that the last part of it is going to happen again. All right. And then the last one was dreadful and terrible, and it had iron teeth. The iron teeth coincided with the iron lower legs, and that was, that was Rome. And then it said it had ten horns. And in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2, you remember it had ten toes. Okay, and so the ten toes came out of the, uh, out of the two iron legs, and here it's talking about ten horns. And Daniel said when he saw the beast that was altogether different than all the other beasts, it was dreadful and it was powerful. And that's what the Roman Empire was. But then it was different. It was diverse from all the other ones. Why? Because then it had these ten horns. And then when we see the ten horns, that coincides with the end when we read the book of Revelation. So you see the interconnection between the two. Daniel prophesied it first. And then, um, so let's look at this verse here. All right. So as uh, concerning, uh, well, first of all, let's look at verse 11 here. He says, uh, in verse 11, it says, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke. So you remember how we talked about it, it, one of them had four heads and then it had four horns. And then it talks about a little horn came up. And when it talks about the little horn coming up, it's talking about the Antichrist. Daniel's prophesying about the Antichrist. And this is how we, this is how part of it, what we know. I beheld, can y'all see that okay? Because I can yeah. blow it up a little bit here. He says, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now, what's interesting is, is that if we move over to Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, look what we see about the beast. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. Let me, let me just stop real quick. You remember how we've been, we spent so much time on 2 Thessalonians? We talked about that a lot just a second ago. If you go back to Revelation 13, and it talks about the Antichrist and the false prophet. It says that the false prophet will perform miracles that will deceive people. And that will, that will cause them to worship the, the beast, which is the Antichrist. Okay? In Revelation, I'm sorry, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says that he will perform <laughs> great wonders. And that the people will believe the lies. And that God allowed all that to happen. And the reason, you know why God allowed it to happen? Is because people had preferred to believe a lie instead of the truth. So God is allowing all this to happen. That's what most Christians that sit in most churches don't understand. They have a misunderstanding of God. They're like, well, but God's good. And God, yeah, he, he's good and he's loving. He loves you so much he sent his son to die for you. But, but what people don't understand is there's also coming a day of judgment and, 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 and pain and sorrow that's going to that's gonna come on the earth. All right. So he performs these miracles, the fall uh, so the, this is the, the beast and the false prophet. And look, and he, those that he had deceived and those that had received the mark of the beast and then that worshiped his image, these both, the false prophet and the, be, and the beast, which is the Antichrist, were cast alive into the lake of, of the lake of fire, which was burning with brimstone. And so I just wanted you to see <clears throat> how closely like this is talking about. This is obviously talking about the Antichrist in, you know, five Hundred BC or something like that. Daniel's prophesying it, and then John on the Isle of Patmos when he when the Lord gives him the revelation is also is talking about the same thing. 
See, I beheld because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, I beheld even till the beast was slain, his body destroyed and given to the burning of flame. All right, let's go ahead and go down to, uh, to verses 13 and 14. But look, this is the good news. See, listen, no matter what we go through, I hope, I listen, I hope, ever, I hope everybody's right. You know? I don't want to have to deal with no kind of craziness. It's bad enough, my friend. <laughs> you know, like the way life is right now, it's rough enough. But, but anyway, can I encourage you and let you know that no matter what you and I have to go through, no matter how bad it gets, that Jesus is going to be right there with you. Look, Jesus was right there with Daniel in the lion's den. Oh, it's easy to preach on, and I understand. We're going to have to have some faith if we ever find ourselves in a lion's den and they salivate, right? Jesus was right there with them, them Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, right? And I understand that it's easy to sit here and preach about it if you ever have to go through it. But hey, Jesus is going to be with you. He's going to be with me. And I got good news. Good news. Jesus wins in the end. Hallelujah. Jesus wins in the end, and that's what the kingdom is turned over to the saints of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you and I will be able to rule and reign with him. Hallelujah. So no, just don't, don't let the devil lie to you, friend. Don't, there, there's nothing that this world has to offer Amen. that's better than Jesus. That's right. Oh, you'd be a whole lot better off. I tell somebody, listen, I'd rather lose a deal than they, they can't look at you in the eye tomorrow. I'd rather lose my life than wake up in the wrong place. Amen. Right. I'm going to hold on to Jesus. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. By his grace. I don't want to sit here and act all tough. Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> so that's what it says in Revelation, uh, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Hallelujah. And that's, that's Revelation 5. That's, re that's further on in Revelation. All nations, languages, tribes are given glory to the Lamb in the book of Revelation. They're all in heaven and they're worshiping him because he's worthy. You know, that was God's will from the beginning whenever the flood happened to, that they would repopulate the earth. And then when you connect that to the book of Revelation, what does it say? It says that all nations, tribes, languages, he's made us to be priests and kings unto our God for he has <coughs> redeemed us with his blood from all tribes, nations. See, that was God's will. It was God's will that there would, and listen, you know, that, that, old, that old lion devil, he tried to mess that up too, right? Right after the flood, what did he do? Come, let us make ourselves a city. That's the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of Babel. That's why I tried to teach all that. It's the same spirit. Come, let us come together in our unity. Man helping man in opposition against God. No, we don't want to repopulate the earth because that's what God wants. God wants there to be a day in the end. And, and, and I believe we're, we're fast approaching I don't know how soon, but I believe we're fast. I don't think it's too hard to see that. Me personally. And, and, and that God's plan was that people from all kindreds, tongues, and nations would be made kings and priests unto their God. And that they would be able to serve him. And that's what the picture shows in heaven. And here we have a connection to it in uh, the book of Daniel chapter 7. It's an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom which shall, shall not be destroyed. Now, it says right here, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I mean, listen, this vision that he had was bothering him. I'll never forget. I know I tell you all my, that story. I don't like to say it too much around my mom, but when I had that dream about my sister, it was a week before she died. Let me tell you something. It was very vivid, very disturbing, very, very painful darkness was in the bedroom I never can tell you I woke up out of a sleep and I wasn't really doing very well with the Lord and I was like wake up and I could feel it it, it was very troubling and, and I mean this is that's just me for my personal life trying to give you trying to prepare me for something that was up ahead and had I been more spiritual I might have been able to do something about it but this is for the whole world they was having a dream and a vision for the whole world to prepare people like you and I or whoever, maybe the next generation, uh, if they're gonna, and, and it troubled him. You know, it was very serious. Verse 16, I came near unto one of them, that's an angel, that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Amen. 
He goes on uh, in verse 19. He says, uh, look at here. He says, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. You remember how I told you when he saw that fourth beast and he saw it was diverse and different from every other, all the other beasts. And, he, and, and it, it, it said it. We covered it last week, but it might not have made as big of a point. It was obviously the ten horns that had Daniel's attention in this dream. And it says, the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron as nails of brass, which devoured broken pieces and stamped the residue with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up. Okay, that's the Antichrist coming out of that. That's another thing in Re that connects to Revelation chapter 17, that the Antichrist is going to come out of this connection with this ten-headed federation, this ten-headed conglomeration of world leaders he's going to be part of that and then he's going to rise up in in power over that and then it says in the book of revelation that all ten of those kings are going to give their power to him and before him three fell even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things whose look was more stout than his fellow he said look at this this is where i was trying to kind of like prepare you for this word saint I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed. That, that means that he had victory. He was, he was able to overpower. So, so the question that you have to ask yourself if you're like me and you think like me, you have to ask yourself, okay, wait, hold on a second though. Jesus told Peter, G Jesus said, whom do men say that I am? Some say that you're Elijah. Some say the prophet Isaiah. Okay, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's right, little Peter, because that's what his name means, Petros. Petra, I, think, I, I, I might get the Greek word wrong, but the point is, Peter's name, the word hey, Peter comes from the form of Petra. The word Petra means a rock. He says, that's right, little rock, and upon this rock, if you look in the Greek, he says, he says, little Pete, he says, little rock. And then he says, and upon this rock, and it means big rock. What's the big rock? The truth that you just spoke, that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. <laughs> upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Can I just tell you just for a second that if there is a time when Christians like the ones in Afghanistan right now are finding themselves or in the past, the ones in Syria were finding themselves and ever in the future where there's Christians that are actually facing some type of a global persecution, just because there might be a time whenever the enemy of our soul seems to be prevailing in that moment. Can I tell you, that doesn't mean that that scripture that I just quoted to you is not true because in the end, God, Jesus said, I will build my church upon this rock upon this truth and the gates of hell will not prevail because in the end the word of God says Jesus is coming back on a white horse and in the end it says that with his mouth a two-edged sword which is the word of the living God I'm telling you right now Jesus ain't coming down here to fight with no sword my friend no, no, no. He rode into town on a donkey the first time. The second time, the Bible says he's coming on a stallion. He is a resurrected king. And I'm telling you right now, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I imagine in a sci-fi movie it'd look pretty cool. Because whenever he speaks, his word is going to be like, I mean, I just is what I imagine. A reverberation and those armies that the Bible says that they're filled to the horse's bridle with blood. The, 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 the valley, there's a valley called Armageddon. The Valley of Megiddo. And, and, it's, and it's between the hundred pound hailstones falling during the wrath of God. And these, these armies dying and killing themselves. And God coming down, Jesus coming down and finishing them off. The Bible says that the, that the blood will be to the, horse, the level of the horse's bridle. It's going to be a great onslaught. And that's going to be the great victory for the people of God. You and I will not be here for that. Thank you, Lord. Well, we will be here for that, but we'll be with him. <laughs> Amen. We'll be coming back. That's what the word of God says. The saints and the angels of God are with the Lord in the end during that. Amen. So, but, it, but, but whoever these saints are at this point in time, Daniel sees in his prophecy that they are being prevailed against. And they will be prevailed against, look what it says here, until the ancient of days came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms 
and shall devour the whole earth. So that right there shows us that there's some kind of a connection to the Roman Empire in some way at the end with the kingdom of Antichrist. Does that make sense? Because the fourth beast was Rome, and, it, and, and it's talking about the end now. So and I just want you to see where people come up with this stuff. Yeah, you, you got to be kind of interested to go back and read it and want to really understand it. But I want you to know that that these concepts are, are formulated out of these passages. It shall tread it down and break it in pieces. The ten horns came out of this kingdom. You see there? So the, so the fourth beast was Rome and the ten horns come out of that kingdom. So we know that the, the, many people call, say it like this. That the, that the and, and Antichrist comes out of the ten horns. So many people say that the ten horn is a ten kingdom federation that is a revitalization of the old Roman Empire, and then from that comes the king comes the Antichrist and his kingdom is formulated. Alright? There are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from all the rest, and he will so that's talking about the Antichrist. He shall speak great words against the Most High. Revelation 13, if you want to go back and look, the Antichrist blasphemes God. The Most High shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And, and look at this. He, this is interesting to me because I think when you do, look, you know what the Word of God says? And when you read, when you read Daniel chapter 1, Jan, Daniel chapter 2, one of those, it says that God changes times and laws. It's, throughout human history, God has caused men to rise. He's caused men to fall. He's caused nations to rise. He's caused nations to fall. Man, man thinks that he's down here manipulating stuff. Right. Man thinks he's, he's nothing but a bunch of little scurrying ants. Yeah, we're not a bunch of little worker bees. We're getting some stuff done. But whenever God says, and he told Nebuchadnezzar that. He said, you're going to give me glory and I'll take your mind away from you. And, and you're not going to give yourself glory. You're not going to give, no man's going to get glory. When God says, I've had enough and I'm done with you, whatever, whoever you is, then guess what? He moves that out of the way. And he lets the yes man. What do you think changes times? I think that that's, it's talking about laws. Because it says right there, change times and laws. Like uh, laws? Yes. No, no, no. I think, I think it's talking about the way that the earth runs according to the laws of men or or the way, and the way that God allows empires to rise. And Romans 13, how it says that he has given the authorities on earth to keep civil, civil, you know what I'm saying, to keep mankind civil. And that you don't have to, that's what Romans 13 says. You don't have to fear him, though he bear the sword, if you do the right thing. So God allows, God has allowed laws to be established for there to be civility on earth. Well, in the Old Testament, who was it that actually stopped the sun? Or that was Hezekiah. Okay, so is it something they do alone? I don't, I don't think that that's what we're talking about right here. I really don't. I think we're talking about the natural flow of things. And that what I was trying to say is, is that in Daniel, I think it's chapter 2. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, it says that God changes times and laws. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'm trying to say there is, is that I think it's more having to do with the fact that God is sovereign and, and in control over the earth. And that he rises one up, it says it in mm -hmm. the book of Proverbs, and then he brings another down. And that when God sees fit, he allows changes to take place. But I think what we're seeing here, this is talking about the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And the point that I'm trying to make is, is that the Antichrist, look, he says... He tries to wear out the saints of the Most High, and he thinks to change times and laws. Now, for, for me, he, want, he wants to play the role of God. He wants to change things. Yeah. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that I believe this is happening right now. Yeah. Yeah. I believe times and laws are being changed before our very eyes. Do you not see? I don't even watch the news anymore. I walk in Robert's living room for five minutes or walk by Miss Angela's bedroom and where they got their TV playing. I'm like, dude, what? Like every time you walk by the TV, something new is happening, some new institution. Oh, now you have to get, you know what I was thinking? I'm about to say this and I'm ready. I, listen, I'm not here to tell you don't get your shot. I ain't never been no preacher that told you not to get your shot. But every time I turn around and see that they're trying to push me harder and harder, I'm like, wait, hold on. I was sitting at the island this morning and I told Miss Angel, I just got a revelation. I was eating a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich, and I just got a revelation. I got a choice, man. Hold on a second. I'm an American citizen, and I got a choice. That's right. No, no. A woman has a choice. Oh, hold on. Follow me. Follow me here. 
A woman has a choice to do what she wants with her body according to the law and the times and the seasons. Wait, so you're telling me I don't have a choice to do what I want with my body? I have, listen, if you want to get your shot, because you get it. I'm having more of a, I almost got the shot. But when I started seeing how they were acting more and more like trying to push me, to push, go on and push, brother, because the harder you push, the harder I'm pushed back. Right. And then, you know what they're going to say? Yes, but that woman's choice isn't affecting another person's life. Wait, hold on a second, you idiot. Did you just hear what you said? <laughs> hold on a second. Did you, who, what are you talking about? It's not affecting another person's life. What about that life that's on the inside of her womb? That's right. See, I, I got a problem. Because I can sit here and say it that loud, I can scream it in the microphone till the veins pop out of my neck. And by the time I'm done, you know what? It's still not going to see. Why? Because the Bible says that the natural mind cannot perceive the things of God because they are spiritually understood. And what I just said right there, sitting there, I was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen that before. No, I'm talking about choice. You can do what you choose to do, but don't tell me. Then I got to do it. Because let me tell you something. There's a natural law of immunity. Don't tell me that all these people. I'm not telling you go run out and kiss somebody with COVID. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Help me here. But I am trying to say that once you. You know, what, you know what a novel virus means? It means it's new to the human race. That means that's why it's so dangerous. And we don't even want to start talking about the evidence is out there about how this stupid thing got started. Let's not even go there. Because that's so old. We don't want to. But a novel virus means it's new to the human race. That's why when somebody has flu, if they go visit a tribe in New Guinea or whatever, it'll wipe out the whole tribe because that tribe had been isolated in the jungle and they had never experienced that antigen from that particular virus. So they had no antibodies whatsoever. But guess what? There's a huge portion of the population right now that has been exposed to the virus and has built up antibodies. Why don't they talk about that? Because they, they want us to do what they want us to do. And that's the point that I'm trying to make. I'm sick and tired of, of us just sitting around here acting like that ain't what's happening. They want us to do what they want us to do and they want to try to corral us. What I'm trying to tell you is they're trying to change times and laws. Already. They're trying to take away our liberties. It's what happened before us. In front of our very eyes. So... And they shall be, and, and look at this, and God's going to allow it. Don't go to sleep, Christian, because guess what? Stay tuned because the stay, same bat time, same bat channel. Y'all remember that? Don't, don't change the channel, Christian, because it's just going to, y'all don't even know what I'm talking about, you young people. That was the old Batman show. Same bat time, same bat channel. Like, in other words, come back tomorrow because it's going to continue, all right? It's not going anywhere. It's just, I'm telling you right now, it's just going to get worse. Look. Let's look at it closely because we're going to stop right here because I've kept telling you. But this was a good sermon. I think. Amen. It says of the Most High and think to change times and laws. That's the Antichrist trying to play God and change times and laws. And they shall be. And they shall be. What's they? What's the what's the pronoun right there? It's connecting to the times and the, and the laws, right? Yeah, right. I mean, let's look at it. I mean, to change times and laws, and they shall be given into His hand. Let's look at another. Uh, I like the NASB. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a, look at this, a time, times, and a half a time. If you break that down in the language, you know what it means? A time is a year. A time is one year. A times is two years. And a half a time, 3.5. Three and a half years. This, just like Jesus had a ministry for three and a half years, the Antichrist is going to have, a, can I use the word ministry? A minute, not really. Uh, 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 oh, he can't even do that. But what you get it. For three and a half years, he's going to be in power. Now, I believe that's specifically speaking of the very last three and a half years because the first three and a half years is a bunch of deception. A bunch of bad stuff's happening, but we don't even really know what's going on. And then all of a sudden, he's going to show up and he's going to, it's going to be like, worship me. And then you're going to know. And then we'll know. And from that point moving forward, God's wrath starts being poured out on the earth. And for that last three and a half years, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining he's going to wish he wasn't rolling and raining during that time. But that's whenever he's going to have and thank the Lord we won't be here. Amen. Because God has not appointed us in the wrath. That's right. Hallelujah. But wrath and tribulation is not the same thing. That's right. Come on. Somebody help me. Wrath, you go through tribulation right now. Wrath and tribulation is not. Wrath comes from God. That's right. 
The evil one can cause tribulation on the earth. And God is allowing it. So I'm not trying to tell you that that proves any point. I'm just trying to make, I am, but I am trying to prove a point. Wrath and tribulation are not the same thing. Okay? Okay, one more. And, uh, the seven seals is the persecution of the Antichrist to Israel. And then begins the judgment of God. He will destroy the earth one third of the time. Trying to still uh, allow men to repent, to pursue repentance. So men and no one to repent. They want to repent. Yeah, they're hard. And that goes back to that Second Thessalonians 2, where God allows the people to be deceived because they didn't want the truth. Because, you know, usually whenever people go through enough, you hope. I mean, but all of us know that we've all been a little hard-headed in our own lives. But we're talking about people just straight up rejecting Jesus, rejecting the gospel, shaking their fist in the air. When, even though they break out in boils on their face, they just get madder and madder and more angry and more angry. And, um, yeah, so... I say again, more than ever, we have to be kingdom minded. Yes, that's right. Yes, because this world's this world's slipping through our fingers, is it not? I mean, it's just not the same world we used to live in. Amen. I mean, at least not me. When I grew up in the in the neighborhood, I mean, we were having fun playing, and it, we, life was so innocent, even in, in my little age. And life is changing so fast, yeah, is. you know. And 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 so many times, people in the church with this superficial gospel that's being preached will go ahead and. Shut that down and we'll pray for a second. But with this, and when I say, I don't try to pick on people. And y'all know that. Y'all know, you, you that come here, y'all know my heart. But like with this superficial gospel that's preached, that's a feel-good message. That just makes people feel feel good. Like they, they, they <coughs> you know, they, they fulfilled some type of an obligation. Or a message that says, oh, you know, you're going to get blessed. And so it kind of reaches out to our carnal nature. And we think. We go to a church where we think we're going to get some kind of seed time harvest, you know, or something like that. That's all. That's not being kingdom minded. Because kingdom mindedness, and when we're talking about a real harvest, we're not talking about a financial harvest in our pocket. I mean, if God blesses us along, I'm all about hard work and getting blessed by the Lord. I've seen God bless me. I'm, 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 not, I'm not trying to shun that. But what I'm trying to say is, is that whenever you start thinking that that's what the kingdom of God is about, that's not what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is about souls. Yeah. The kingdom of God is about he's creating a family that will live in eternity. Yeah, that's it. The kingdom of God is all about the seed of the gospel being sown and producing a harvest. Amen. How many people are there that are in your school or in your or that you work with that don't know the Lord? They don't know the Lord. And that's another thing I'd like to say as we close out of here. There's a whole big difference between us knowing God, believing God, and even loving God, as opposed to serving God. It's very important that we understand that. We can love the Lord. There's a, I don't question whether there's tons of people and sitting in churches that love God. You know, but, but are, are we serving God? Because if we go to church twice a week, and then the rest of the time we're living just like the world, and we're doing everything that the world does, are we really serving God when we do that? When our life looks exactly like them, that's not serving God. And I'm not judging because the Lord knows that I've had my own struggles. But I'm just trying to say it. Serving God means that we're surrendering to the will of the Amen. Lord, that we want to live for him. And like Galley said, we're kingdom minded. That means that we're concerned about, the, about souls on the earth. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your word, oh Lord God, and we know that you're allowing, you're going to allow things to happen, but Lord, we know who wins in the end, and we're so grateful that you allowed your beautiful gospel to ring true in our ears and to transform our hearts, Lord, and I pray right now, Lord, for each and every one of us in this place, Lord, that we would not get so caught up in the craziness of the world right now. But and how fast life is going, Lord, especially with all the things going on around us between the storm and the we don't even remember the pandemic anymore, Lord. But but really this storm hitting this area and, and then just life was busy even before that, Lord, that sometimes we can get so distracted that we forget what's important. Never let us forget that. Lord. Never let us forget how you changed our hearts and how you pulled us out of the world and into your marvelous life. I pray for each and every one of us here, everybody that would have watched on video, Lord, that you would allow by your spirit to move on our hearts, Lord God, and to draw us, Lord, closer and closer to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen.